I'm going to change a little bit gears here because I'm not going to show you a lot of grass with cool microbiome results. But what I'm going to present to you here today is the new, uh, this new in vitro model that Dr. Gomez talked about. And as we are going to see, they can be, they are known as organoids or also known as antroids or colonoids, depending on the site that they are uh, uh, developed from. So we have been discussing, and this audience here is uh, very familiar with the importance of the GI tract in the pork production. The GI tract is not important because it absorbs and gets all of the nutrients that we give to the pigs, but also because it's a site of important disease. Not only endemic disease, but also, for example, all of the coronavirus that have been uh, causing trouble over the years. And it's not easy to understand the host pathogen interaction and how is this relationship in the GI tract. It's very complicated. Here we can see, for example, on, this, uh, on the left, how is the small intestine and how many players we have here uh, simultaneously. So we don't need to know only about the pathogen, but also about how the pathogen is presented to the, uh, to the pig. Is it through M cells? Is it through epithelial cells? How is this antigen presented to the immune cells here in the pious patch? Or how is the antibody production after the uh, pig gut is facing this pathogen? And similarly, we have um, bacteria and virus that can infect the large intestine. And as uh, Dr. Uh, Mateus showed us, it's a very complex environment as well with a very rich microbiome that interferes in our knowledge. And we only develop strategies for controlling and preventing enteric disease when we know very well what's going on here. And what we have been using to understand that. So for many years we have been using animal models. They are instrumental to understand these relationships. They are well established. But let's imagine that we are, we are talking here about pigs, but in many cases we use um, rats or uh, mice to, uh, as a model for the disease. But how we control this uh, microbial diversity, how we interpret these interspecies variances, we also know how expensive it is to maintain an experiment based in in vivo trials and how labor intensive they can be, as well as they raise a lot of ethical concerns. So trying to overcome these uh, limitations, the single cell type cultures have been used, uh, widely used. They're close to the real situation because you have um, the cell type that you're, you want to study. They are well established. They are relatively cheap, but they lack the relationship between all of different cell types that we have in the intestine. And for those of you who don't remember very well how it's based, it's a monoculture, so it's based in a single cell type grown in laboratory conditions with temperature and atmosphere well controlled, and they are grown here in this in flasks with optimized media. But they are not perfect. So in the past few years, researchers from all around the world, they have been developing new in vitro models. And it's not only for the gut, but also for other systems. But what are organoids? They are organotypic three-dimensional structures, and they grow in a matrix or a scaffold matrix that uh, allows them to grow in different directions. And they can be originated from embryonic stem cells, induced polypotent cells, as well as primary tissues. And so, um, as a, uh, to give you an example of how important they have been, for example, organoids generated by brain cells, they were fundamental to prove that Zika virus is, uh, is able to cause microencephaly in baby humans, in human babies. So this is how they have been very important throughout the years. And with that, uh, we, with them, we overcome some of those limitations that I mentioned before, because organoids, they present uh, all organ-specific cell types on, on their surface. They function as a tissue of origin. 
They self-renew and self-organize as well as they reduce the use of animals because from a single animal you are able to generate different organoids and then keep those organoids in the laboratory conditions, freeze and thaw them as they are needed. However, it's a new technique and it requires some expertise, but this is why we are here to learn a little bit more about them. So now I'm going to give you a little bit more details about the intestinal organoids. So they can receive two different names depending on the, uh, on the region of the intestine they are resembling. So if you're talking about the small intestine, you name them as enteroids. And if you uh, develop them from colon, they are named colonoids. Talking about the enteroids, they have the crypt and the villus region that it's very similar to the, uh, to the intestine per se. So they are considered morphologically similar and therefore they have a tissue-like morphophysiology. So this is a nice picture, it's, uh, as Dr. Do Gomez mentioned, it's enhanced to be uh, clear. They are kind of a sphere uh, uh, surrounded by epithelial cells that con and contain a lumen. This is how they look in the reality. So here we have um, the epithelium of the uh, mini gut, as you prefer, and this is the luminal region. Here we can see more details how they are very similar to the intestine. So in this case here we have a picture of this uh, scheme of the small intestine in which we can observe the crypt compartment and the villus compartment. In the crypt compartment we can observe stem cells and um, when we go towards to the villus, we have the progenitor cells that are also named transit amplifying cells. And those are the cells that divide and are going to generate the completely differentiated cells. Then when they move towards to the villus, they then uh, receive signals for differentiation. And it's where we are going to find the enterocytes, goblet cells, and tuft cells. Bonnet cells are also present, but uh, differently from goblets, enterendocrine cells stuffed in enterocytes, instead of moving towards to the villus, they move down here and they are uh, observed along with stem cells. And this is basically exactly what we observe in enteroids. So here we have a real picture of an enteroid, and here we have a scheme of this one in which we can observe here in the center of this structure is the lumen, it's kind of a, the lumen of the intestine where the dead cells are moved and where um, any proteins or any substance are released. And here the lumen is surrounded by those epithelial cells as well as in the intestine, stem cells, trans amplifying cells and all of the differentiated ones. And taking advantage of this similarity, Many research have, researchers have been using those enteroids to understand the relationship of pathogens and hosts, especially focusing on human disease. So as an example, they have been discovered that, that Shigella, as well as Salmonella, can use M cells as a portal of entry into the um, uh, intestine. They have also used enteroids to understand the cellular modulation caused by cryptosporidium parvum and salmonella. And they also studied the cytokine release when uh, there is a clostridium difficile infection. And very importantly too, the uh, enteroids have been used to understand infections by norovirus and rotavirus. And here, just um, out, of, out of curiosity, they can, enteroids can also be used to understand and to um, uh, study better non-infectious disease such as colorectal carcinoma. Going a little bit into details, uh, these groups, Zeng et al, in 2016, they used uh, enteroids as a model for cryptosporidium parvum, and they infected mice, mouse enteroids with crypto, and here is the figure where they confirmed the infection, so in blue, it's an immunofluorescence uh, image in which you observe blue is the nuclei, in red is the cell membrane, and the uh, green little dots represent cryptosporidium parvum. So they confirmed that the uh, model worked, and they, they uh, were observing that mouse here infected with mouse uh, enteroids infected with cryptosporidium parvum, 
they were smaller and less developed than the con negative control. And how we can observe that? We can observe that by the numbers of what they named as buds. And those buds can be understood as the number of crypt um, compartments in the, in the entroids. But they measured it, and they did, found, they did find statistical relevance. They observed a smaller number of entroids with higher number of buds, or in other words, uh, the infected uh, entroids were less developed. And um, it, they interpreted the results, and they concluded that the cryptosporidium parvum uh, leads to a diminished or decreased number of stem cells. Another cool example is about Salmonella enterica cirovar uh, typhi murium. And I, I brought here two examples on the left. We can see that this group, they measured cytokine released in enteroids infected with uh, Salmonella. And I know you have seen it before, but I want to highlight here that this, that this is a cheaper model and more controlled model uh, in relation to in vivo with very similar results to um, in comparison to that. And here on the right, another group published um, the production of alpha deficient 5, that is one of the first um, immune response against microbial infections in the intestine. And as we can, it's immunohistochemistry in which we can see that the white type mouse infected with Salmonella had a uh, very expressive amount of alpha defensin A in the epithelium. And last but not least, I have here two examples of what's a kind of a new way to treat infections as we saw in the first presentation. So it's based on the knowledge of the host pathogen interactions. So the same group, they published uh, in 2015, 2017, different results. On the left, we can see that they use monoclonal antibodies against rotavirus, and they tested it first in KCO2 cells, so it's a single cell type monoculture, as I explained before, and they observed that this treatment, based in a dilution of 1 to 50 or 1 to 100, was able to diminish the amount uh, of viable rotavirus particles in the system. Similarly, in the human organoids, the results were also observed. However, instead of noticing this uh, dilution, effective dilution of 1 to 50 to 1 to 100, they observed that the dilution can be as high as 1 to 1,000, which means that even though the cell lines are very uh, relevant and they can help us to understand it a little bit, maybe they are not resembling what happens uh, exactly in vivo, and this is uh, where we are very closer to what's going on in the gut. And then they also, uh, after those results, they developed this antivirulence therapy, not, not based at this time on monoclonal antibodies, but knowing the mechanism by which rotavirus cause diarrhea, they created uh, a small mo molecule that targets a mechanism of pathogenesis there, and then they compared a negative control in relation to a, co a group of enteroids treated with 10 nanomolar of the drug, and they observed a substantial decrease in the number of viable rotavirus in the organoids, as we can see here. So green uh, label is for uh, rotavirus that were very, very expressive here in the non-treated group, and they were almost absent in the treated group. And they were also, they measured it, and they found the statistically uh, differences. So you may be wondering, so why do we care? Where are we? What are you doing with that? So in, very interestingly, when you go to the literature, you don't see a lot of uh, veterinary stuff uh, going on with androids. So we decided to go for that, and uh, we are using the model to understand proliferative enteropathy, and as you may know, it's caused by Lausanne intracellularis. Lausanne intracellularis cause this cellular proliferation in uh, the small intestine, mainly in the crypts, that cause this gross appearance of the intestine, it's very thickened, However, this mechanism of proliferation is still unknown. And the cell monocultures have been used um, th throughout the years to understand how Lausanne could ever cause this um, cellular proliferation. 
However, we just finished uh, this chapter of my thesis in which we have data to support that the traditional cell monocultures do not proliferate under Lawson inter intracellular infection. So we do need another model to understand this, the pathogenesis of the disease and perhaps in the future be able to develop a new strategy for preventing and controlling the disease as other researchers are doing with other pathogens. So what we did. So this experiment started last year and at that time we didn't have pig enteroids to work with. So we used mouse enteroids and uh, to uh, work with them, they are very tiny, so they are named also as mini guts. We put them in a microscope and we need to micro inject them with a machine that is very similar to the injector used for in vitro fertilization. So at this time, we used three, three treatment groups. The first one is a negative control stereo media. We also use this as a second um, negative control. It's the supernatant of Lawsonia culture, but it's future sterilized. And we use Lawsonia intracellulars in suspension. This material was used for immunolabeling, RTUQ-PCR, and to measure the enteroids area. So, as well as the group with crypto did, we also did immunofluorescence. We proved that the model was infected by Lawsonia. Here in blue we have the nuclei, in green we have Lausanne antigen, so it was present throughout the epithelium. We also did some immunohistochemistry and we observed Lausanne in our enteroids. And this is the results for the enteroid area. So far we didn't detect statistical significance, but we still uh, need to run one more repetition and we are uh, hoping to find some statistical relevance here at this point because by uh, R2QPCR we also observed that there's something going on around three days post infection because when we tested for a proliferation marker we observed an increased um, expression in both in um, Lausanne intracellular infected group and in the supernatant uh, injected group and uh, very similar to what we observed for goblet cells. And it's uh, well published that Lausanne intracellular infection decreased the number of goblet cells. So, uh, so far we have uh, been seeing that the mouse enteroids are permissive to the infection. We observed those changes at three days post infection. So we still lack one repetition and we hope that with that we can prove that something is going on at three days post infection. And with that we are going to proceed with um, verifying the cellular proliferation observing if there is change in other cell types, and then what? So uh, we hope to initiate further with research to look um, in more details for this mechanism of proliferation, and in the future we be able to uh, design these new strategies for controlling the disease. But you may be wondering, what about the pig enteroids? So uh, they work characterized in 2013, and it was in 2015 when the first paper was published. And actually it was not focusing host pathogen interactions, but it was more in the nutrition side. So it seems, as you can see here, it's been a while since, um, uh, since the first publication, so it's a little bit difficult to establish them in the laboratory. But I have good news, because here we have what we have been developing. So we already have the pig enteroids developed and we are finishing the characterization of them. So we have HNE in which we can observe that they are well polarized. We can see morphologically here some of the goblet cells which we confirm by uh, PAS staining here. So all of this blue, a uh, dark blue here represents goblet cells which means that the cells and the enteroids are developing, growing and maturating in completely differentiated cells as well as we run some ki 67 immunohistochemistry to prove that those cells are alive, health, and proliferating as it's, it is expected because it resembles the intestinal epithelium. And um, we still need to evaluate how would be the effects of this freezing thawing process because as I mentioned before, it's ideal that those enteroids survive this process so we don't need to euthanize a pig every single time that they are needed in the uh, laboratory. 
And I cannot leave this presentation without mentioning Dr. Milena Sakis-Salsis. She is the faculty and CFANS that has expertise in gut physiology. She has the knowledge about enteritis and she's uh, kindly sharing with us all of this cool material. And to finish, I would like to highlight how important and promising this in vivo or ex vivo, as you prefer, model is uh, to investigate these host pathogen interactions because they are closer to in vivo, but you have a, a little bit of control. You can have them in the lab, you can manipulate them, but we need uh, this expertise. We are going for that, so we have been successful in uh, working with the, um, the model. And as in my first slides, I would like to finish it here highlighting how important is the knowledge of the host pathogen interactions. Without that, it's not possible to develop good vaccines or good strategies or alternatives for antimicrobials as we are needing right now. So this is why we believe that this model is so promising to understand these enteric diseases in pigs. With that, uh, I, would, I would like to acknowledge everybody in Dr. Milena, uh, Milena's lab as well as in Dr. Gebhardt's lab.